Welcome to a Design Between the Lines live special. New school versus old school. Co-sponsored by With It and ISFD. Featuring an all-star panel of award-winning designers, Christopher Sandomenico, furniture designer at Caracol, Katina Roscoe, founder of Katina Unlimited Designs, Amy Kersner, director of furniture at Curry & Company, and Liz Shaver, furniture designer with Auto & More, and current ISFD president. We had a lively discussion about the future of home furnishings product design, the use of technology and design, exploring the design process, trends, and other topics, including questions from our audience that day. This event was recorded live on April 7th, 2019, in what is now the loft at Congdon Yards in High Point, North Carolina. In the 1990s, there was a term used in design called design thinking. That was coined as methods and ideas defining the creative process back in the day. What does design thinking today mean to you? To me, it's something that we as designers sort of take for granted. It's the process of organizing our thoughts before we put them on paper, our doodles, you know, just processing that thought, but on a, on a, on a different level. Uh, whether we uh, receive uh, a brief from our clients or uh, a theme is established or a direction uh, from our clients or if it's just something that we make up ourselves that we're just working on a direction because we see a trend that de design thinking is just the mental process that we go through to organize our thoughts as we try to translate that into product anybody else like to comment on sure sure um, Design thinking to me is in everyday life what you do. If you walk into a coffee shop, you look at what people are wearing, you see how it's dressed, you feel the vibe, and you just get a real feel for how things are in everyday life. So just gathering information and then implying, implementing that into your design thinking process to create something great. Comments? Additions? Um, I. I agree with both. Um, I think in the world that we live in right now, we are overly exposed to so much um, brand content, imagery, et cetera, and it really takes an effect on what you process in your mind and what, how you want to dress, what you want your house to be, and it constantly evolves because in one moment you're inspired by pink, and then the next oh my gosh, teal is in, I want, I want teal this, I want this, and um, the design thinking process is just, it's constantly evolving, and it is putting all your thoughts together to create new product and constantly keeping up with the trends. Chris, anything to add there? Um, yeah, design thinking. I had to look that up before I came here. I think we do things differently in the furniture industry. Part of it, though, I work with a manufacturer. We've developed processes that work and I don't know if you all have dedicated manufacturers but if you are bringing that product to the end user you really need to know what their capabilities are your strengths and you have to know who you are and who your client is that's important um, don't try to be someone that you're not how do you begin you've got ideas you've collected these things you've got folders you've got you're going to sit down and you're going to say, let's say you've been given a brief or the manufacturer you're working with says we need a new bedroom collection, just or whatever you might entertain, and you're going to sit down. Maybe they didn't give you direction, but you've got something in your head. How do you begin taking that from your head down to either paper or on the screen? What Liz said is very important. Um, as designers, I don't think that we ever get to shut our brains down. Wherever, wherever we look, wherever we're, you know, the coffee shop, whatever, we're always picking up on patterns, on details, on whatever. So we're, we, the, I, I don't know that there is a, really a starting point until you start, you know, mm -hmm. to collect those ideas. But uh, yes, for me, being on the older side of the fence, uh, of course, my office has always been filled with magazines, with samples from our suppliers and our vendors. 
Um, but more, in more recent time, of course, there are so many uh, lifestyle websites on the internet that you can just, not only just in the observation of the world around us, but also gather you know, direction and feel and flavor and expression from what, you, what we find on those websites. Liz, Amy? Sure. Um, I find inspiration. I'm surprised how much inspiration I find on Instagram. You can find so many people there. Um, bloggers, designers, furniture companies. I mean, you'd be amazed how many high-end companies, how many pictures they post of their product. I mean, you get sneak peeks of things that are coming before they're even out there. So Instagram is a big thing for me because you can see everybody in one place and it's all very visual. And in addition to that, uh, shelter magazines, going to stores, just seeing what's out there and seeing what we can do better, um, coming up with an idea. It all starts with an idea and then just taking that idea throughout the process to creating something that there's a need for. Well, I couldn't agree more with you. It never stops. You're always on, um, you're always gathering. Where you start, I mean, I, the furniture industry is just constantly constantly issuing out new product every six months. Um, stuff that you were working on two years ago that wasn't relevant becomes relevant now. Um, I wish I could have a defined process and how it happens, but if you work or you're in an office, you see all the creativity that's happening. It's, you, it's almost like a coin toss, which way are we gonna go first? It is well-educated. Like you know what the clients want, you want to be, you want the direction, you you know what's current, you know, and um, you have to have a focus. You have to have parameters too. I know most of you travel. I know you travel quite a bit. I know Amy travels. I think Amy has a brass plate on a seat in an airplane, and it's hers forever. But does travel? Do you kind of gain some inspiration as you're traveling to different countries? And I mean, I've seen your Instagram, so I know there are there are some in moments that you have that you get an idea. Yes, always. Of course, I'm traveling to go check samples. We're looking at new vendors, um, but we also have the opportunity to do design inspiration trips. So I'll be heading to Milan next week for design inspiration. And for instance, when you're constantly thinking of things and also on the move, um, two years ago, I was in Milan, we were just walking through a market, I found a museum, walked in, there was, oddly enough, a weaponry exhibit, not really into weapons myself, <laughs> but I had snapped some photos of these really beautiful maces and spears and weapons, and uh, we launched accessories last market. And so when we did that, I went back to those pictures, and we ended up creating um, maces and spears into these really beautiful solid cast brass sculptures with a marble base on them. So inspiration can come from wherever you are. Uh, and then of course, when I'm traveling, you're seeing different capabilities from all these vendors. You're bringing them new materials, but they're also showing you new materials along the way or um, cottage industry shops that they have that are close by just an hour away that they think that you might be interested in. Thank you, thank you. Katina, specifically to your, um, and by the way, congratulations for winning the Dining uh, Pinnacle Award uh, last year. Can you tell me a little bit about where the inspiration, what, what started that whole ball rolling for that collection? Well, what John is referring to, the Pinnacle Award was uh, for casual dining with an Amish manufacturer uh, to take, uh, to change the perception of what Amish furniture is all about was the, the whole intention of going to work for this company. So the Amish people are tremendous craftsmen. Um, they can build anything, but they have no sense of fashion, no sense of design. How does that intersect with our lives here, right? So it was very interesting. Um, and we started with a story. And the story, the name of the collection was Local Harvest. And Local Harvest, you know, in our lives today, uh, organic, um, buy local, eat local, stay local, you know, is, is a major uh, focus or a major direction in our lives and in uh, society, you know, now of interest to people. So um, we took 
you know, the heritage, the authenticity of that Amish, of those Amish roots, and then created the story of um, local harvest, uh, the farm farming, of course, it was very convenient that um, modern farmhouse, you know, was a trend in our lives, in our industry, and um, t just told a story behind it uh, through uh, artisan, you know, hand handcrafted, artisan made, uh, um, just the, the heritage, the authenticity, the integrity that comes with that Amish product. Uh, and just tied it into something that's more relevant to our lives today. And it was, you know, a successful collection. Chris, moments after you got the award, after the surprise look kind of calmed down, we were behind the stage and you had the award in your hand last October. And we talked about where this idea came from for that particular piece you won the, the Pinnacle Award. Uh, any idea? Can you remember? Because you've got a million products I know in your head right now for a future. Do you remember where that all came from? Oh boy, that's one of those folders that you have that you had a, a, a drawing in and you left it alone and then you've come back two years later and you have the chance to do it. I had inspiration from an antique um, and the draw, there's a, a wire pull in the back um, that adds detail with pleating and I just wanted to make something dramatic in it basically envelop you like a collar. I also wanted to do a wing chair that didn't have arms and it succeeded in that, in that happening. That. Another thing about that sample, every time when you do chairs, you know, you're working on all the proportions, you're working on stuff. Um, I built from previous designs. I used the ferrules from a previous uh, chair, so I knew that was going to be okay. But you have to think of a chair, I think of chairs as a sculptural piece and you should look at it from all angles. And usually you get to the sample department and you're redoing everything or they didn't make it to spec and it's never right. That one was 98% right the first time so I guess that one was meant to be. <laughs> Making product experience is very important today. Conveying a story or a feel uh, arising from knowledge that the home is at the core of human health, happiness, and growth. It really is. This is very different than years ago when we just created pretty functional objects to fill a room. Please speak to this influence, this experiential influence, uh, as part of your design process. Are you including that? Are you th is that even coming into the process at all? Do you, you want to start with that, Amy? For us at Curry, we are going by the creative director's visions. So sometimes it's style stories for certain parts of the room, uh, but then there's a lot of freedom for the design team to just come up with their own trends and what they're seeing and put that into product. I know for me, there was a moment in time when I felt like there was a lot of masculine pieces in our line and I wanted something to be feminine. And there's a presence about that um, that you either create with the lines of the product or the hardware of the product or the finishes. And so I wanted the experience of that piece to relate to women and, and for them to be drawn to it and think that it's just beautiful and they want it. Um, that piece happened to be a piece of hardware that we worked with a sculptor, which was a stylized camellia flower. And I never thought in my wildest dreams it would be our best-selling piece of product, but it just happens to be. Um, and I think in this industry too, a lot of women are buying product. Um, a lot of interior designers are women, or women are making those decisions in the household of what's going into certain rooms. Good answer. Liz? Sure, yeah. So I think everybody nowadays versus back when my grandparents were buying furniture, they just really want to be a part of the experience. They want to be a part of the story. The, it starts, it's made, say it's made in America, and somebody's, there's a craftsman that started there, and then it went through this factory, and now it's in the retail stores, and now it's on in my house, in my kitchen, and I'm a part of that story. And it's not so much what it's made about, made of, and it's not so much the specific 
design, but it is the entire feeling. And, and if it makes the consumer feel good, if it makes the consumer inspired to, to make their space more beautiful, then I call that a success. I think that uh, Liz is exactly right. Furniture is much more than just um, a box to keep your socks. And you guys probably heard me say that before. <laughs> I love that one. Oh, but, it, but it really, we in the furniture industry need to not forget that we touch through our furniture. We touch people's lives on an emotional level, how it make, how that product makes them feel. So it's not just, and again, you know, going back to the past, you know, sometimes suits of furniture, it was just like, okay, we had 18th century suit, you know, in our living room, in our bedrooms, in our dining room, and it was all just product. But um, as we have evolved, as our lifestyles have evolved, I think it's even more significant to create that connection that feel, that uh, to tap in to the emotional side of our product so that we can convey uh, an expression that connects with how people want to live. Express to me your thoughts of when you're dealing with a manufacturer and you're having to thread the needle through your idea, getting your idea across, getting that CAD over to them, getting them to make that first sample, and maybe 80% of the time it's not coming out like the chair did, and, uh, and you have to wing it or do something while you're there. Tell me a little bit about what it's like to, you're in corporate, you're thinking about your brand strategy, you know what company, what this is gonna have to look like when it gets on the floor, next market. How is that all crashing in when you're standing there looking at the sample that's gonna need some kind of work? I think it's the most important part of the design. Uh, 60 percent of it, I would think. You have to, I always think about like, you're there, maybe that metal isn't working. It has to be a piece of furniture that's gonna endure, to, it has to be functional. You have to look at, well, maybe was that a good idea to put this metal here or that? Is it better to change like this? So much happens on the ground. And you know, when you're, your portfolios and your, your company, you know, you can't put, you have to design within your company's product line. Um, sure, I'd love to make a graphite chair or a carbon fiber chair, but that it's going to be outside of its price range. So you pick and pull and you maybe add, you may subtract, and you hope it ends up being a symphony when it's done. Because like you said, it's going in somebody's home and you want it to arrive there and you want them to receive satisfaction that they have it. Why do it? You're just wasting all <laughs> materials and everything if you're not doing it for some type of glorification in the end. Mm -hmm. True. Questions on the side of screen and mouse? Oh. <laughs> um, in terms of process? In the process and having to funnel all this oh, thinking. Yeah. Of, right. I, I think as designers, you're melding, a, like you're blending that your personal style with what the company wants. So my personal aesthetic is very minimal and modern. My company's is not uh, the company I work for. And I have been told that the furniture that they see is a blend of both because I'm trying to incorporate certain lines um, that are more modern into those pieces. When it comes down to that process and technology and things like that, for me, I'm d doing quick sketches, going straight to the computer, um, and then sending those renderings or concept drawings overseas. Uh, we have teams over there that are doing the CAD. It comes back to me and I redline it and make changes. And then I'm over there checking samples. But that doesn't stop that process because as we're there on the ground, we're constantly developing more product. So I'm at a metal manufacturer in India. I see a candlestick and I take the candlestick, grab my iPad with the pencil, and I'm changing that candlestick into now a, a column table. Um, so you're, you're using technology and constantly evolving, and your process, for me, is never the same in every situation. Okay, over to the pencil side. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always thought that um, 
there's so many variables in the process of, of furniture design. Um, our, we as designers must accept the design challenge with consideration to all of those variables. It's not just drawing, you know, the first um, piece of furniture or light, a sculptural piece right off the top of our head. You do have to consider, you know, all of the manufacturing. For me, uh, I'm a, a freelance, so I work with different manufacturers or different brands. And many variables have to be considered from the very beginning. You know, their price point, uh, wh what their brand, um, who they are, who that brand, you know, you know are they, who they are. Uh, for instance, Amy is a luxury brand. Caracol is a luxury brand. Most of the products that I design are more mid-price, mid to high price, and more um, mainstream, you know, residential. So there are many variables that we have to design within those parameters. It's not just like arbitrarily, oh, I, I like this curve, or I like this shape, or I like this material. It has to be with intention. Liz, you, you have a unique thing as well with, with just, you know, just like Katina does, that you've got a number of clients in all kinds of different mm -hmm. directions. How do you handle that? It's, it's challenging, but it's exciting because I'm never, des I'm not always designing for the same client. So my lower end client might have different needs. For my lower end clients, I start with the best version of what I think that piece should be. And then usually it's beat to hill. <laughs> and then it's just bulky and this and that. And then, oh, we need a corner block, so we need to chunk it up. So once it finally gets to the floor, it's not exactly what I had in mind, but it's what needs to happen for that company. And then also we have to consider sources and materials. If, if my furniture is gonna be made over in Vietnam and I want to have a metal base, are we gonna be able to find that source? And is that metal base gonna be from the same place that that top, the wood top is gonna be from? How are we gonna connect it? We need to make sure that if they're shipped separately that there's a good way to put it together. Um, so there's a lot of variables, but it's, it's challenging and exciting. <laughs> I'm sure you've had a moment, whether you were overseas, you were here, where you had to throw everything you knew out the window, think outside the lines, blow the box up you were sitting in and go, let's do it this way. Has any of you had that experience uh, where you were either on the ground, standing in front of something and went, Okay, I'm going to change the whole way we're doing this. Oh, good. All the time. Yeah. All right. Well, give me an example. Uh, whoever wants to start, go ahead. Give it a shot. Well, I, okay. I think that's the exciting part because we all um, experienced art school, uh, design school. We know the golden rule. We know we have a sense of proportion. But when you are able to create uh, a satisfying composition with unexpected scale, or uh, juxtaposing something that's very linear and um, geometric and then create a beautiful ornate um, flower as a piece of hardware. So you're, you know, something, something geometric and then something kind of organic. You know, when you throw out those rules of symmetry or whatever and create, that's, what, that's when it really gets good. I always like to push the envelope a little bit, but for my clients, if you push it too far, color too far out the lines, the customer's not gonna get it, it's not gonna sell, and I'm not gonna make any money. So that's, that's not a success to me. Um, so I have to find the, re the nice little balance between being a super creative designer and being proud of my work, but then also still stay in that box of what that customer, what that manufacturer represents and needs. So, you know, while I want to go and create some crazy sculptural piece, the companies I design for, they don't need that, and that's not something that we do. So I just take a little tidbit of that and put it on a drawer front or something, and um, that's my way of pushing the envelope, but not too far. <laughs> Chris, you want to? Well, just like you said, that always happens. And what I have found in those circumstances, you end up innovating and figuring out you have to Usually it's structural problems, and so, or, and you have to balance out the 
aesthetic and what you're doing to fix the problem. And when you do that, again, like this, I work with a manufacturer, um, all of that information trickles down, you know, like, okay, two years ago you ran into a problem, you couldn't figure out how to get around it, and you, you s solved it. Now, today, you can send them stuff and you'll have already have that solution. And um, that's what has happened in many cases for me. Amy? Um, in terms of bad things gone really bad, <laughs> or, or crossing those lines and coloring outside the, outside the lines, um, there's been many times when I'm on the factory floor, you're there to see samples. I always call it Christmas for me, because I love it. Um, and you, you see it and you're like, this, this just doesn't work. This just doesn't work. Sometimes there's nothing that you can do to really fix it. And for us, at least for Curry, we're like, just drop it. Just drop the sample. We're going to start new. We don't need this one piece. We would never do that with multiple pieces, but there's sometimes that one piece. It's like, let's stop now. Don't waste our time. Don't waste the factory's time, don't ship the sample over because we're never gonna order it. You need to take those things into consideration. Um, and then there's been times when I send them a color swatch and I get there and I was like, oh, that's not the blue I was really thinking of. And then I'm in the back dipping different types of veneer into blue, mixing it up, looking at the phone saying, I want this blue, where's the Pantone chip? And you're just running around, working with the team on the ground, trying to make it happen. And that is the most exciting part, the most fun part. D finishes on our shoes, they're freaking out, wiping my shoes, I'm laughing. It, it, it's, that does happen, and, and those are the best moments um, while you're there. You know, now is a great time to be a designer. You've got technology, you've got software coming out every five seconds. New age materials we talked about earlier, fabrics that are coming out of nowhere. With modern lifestyles, uh, bringing exciting opportunities along with these materials and technologies to create products as a designer, how do you address this high tech or utilize it uh, in your work process these days? Liz? I just try to keep up. <laughs> I try to be aware of the new programs that are out there. I don't try to learn every single one as it comes out because that would take a lot of time. Um, but I just try to keep up and try to do the best that I can to stay with the technology. I, mean, I still use SolidWorks to put in the proportions, put in the dimensions, so I know exactly what I'm gonna get when I get to the factory. Um, but any, you know, anything organic, I'm gonna draw it. And then when I travel, I'm with that iPad and pencil because you, know, you could take the picture and scale it up and, and redraw it very quickly. And then literally the vendor where we're at, he takes his iPhone and takes a picture of my iPad of the sketch that I just drew on the iPad. Um, so with that technology, I'm, I'm trying to keep up. I can't, I mean, I cannot do some of these really articulate and beautiful renderings on an iPad. I just can't do that. I could do it on pen and paper, but the skill set of that, and it's just something that I, I keep practicing, but I know that I don't necessarily need it. Um, and you find what best suits you and what is the best medium for you to convey your products to your vendors. Old school, pencil, <laughs> pencil, markers, drawing board. <laughs> I get my hands dirty. Lead, markers, you know. And CJ and others uh, always did, you know, the CAD work and the digital renderings. Um, we had clients, some that preferred the old-fashioned way and loved the softness uh, and kind of the the romantic feel of the hand renderings, and then there were others that really wanted to see uh, as close to a photograph as they could get. So, um, you know, we're I still now uh, just do the hand renderings for the most part, and uh, most of my clients are satisfied with that. Chris? Um, well, I do everything by pencil as well. The technology, I have, it really, on our end, and in my experience, has been with the manufacturing, um, what 
what I'm seeing the, uh, Asia and China is doing now with all these materials. They're automating factories now, um, laser cutting. The It's really helped us create stuff. Uh, there was, I did a sofa this market and it had a carving on a top rail and I was challenged. Someone wanted to do it as a casting of metal. I was like, there's no way they're gonna do it. I just did not think they were going to do it. Sure enough, we pushed them and pushed them. And now there's a piece that has, it's like applique. It's 30 inches long, you know, and then it's made in one piece and it's beautifully plated. So that's how I see the biggest effect of technology um, is with our, my product. We do media, but we're not like home office or anything like that. Right, right. But I think you all will agree that um, technology is what really has pushed us all as designers to to change. I mean, you said those big wall units. I mean, <laughs> I would, you know, I drew Almars for those big monstrosities of televisions. So um, we, we in the furniture industry even kind of struggle to keep up with technology. I mean, who can keep up? We, for sure. You know, yeah. yeah. We take bits and pieces and where we can incorporate it. Um, and we take advantage of what we can. So, yes. for instance, I skip that drawing step unless it's absolutely necessary, like in a meeting. I go immediately to the computer because that's where all my resources are. I have all the details of everything I've ever designed right there in one place. If, if I need to refer to a size that worked very well on a dining table for somebody else, I can take that size, but then remember that I'm doing a new design. And so all my resources are really there on my computer. It can say, make things happen pretty quickly. We've all in the last few years seen certain pieces of furniture, TV armoire, completely disappear from the face of the planet. Yeah. We've kind of come to the conclusion of, of the questions that I had. Are there any other questions from the audience? Do you think that our old processes will return? And do you think that it's already happening right now? You know, we, he we hear traditional is coming back mm -hmm. right? uh, as a trend. Well, traditional won't ever be what traditional was when we were first drawing it. We will take elements and the essence of what traditional uh, expresses, but we will reconfigure it into what works in today's lives. I don't know about you, but I wanna stay young and hip and cool and I've got a 30-year-old daughter who kind of keeps me that way and gives, you know, gives me exposure to that millennial mindset. There, there are a lot of cool perspectives that we can draw from that, and, and it makes us stay fresh. So the, the process, going to that process level, uh, I think that we need to, um, uh, uh, empathize with the consumer and you know put ourselves in their shoes or become one um, how many um, of the of our clients that, they, that you know our, our manufacturers that sell furniture that baby boomers were the biggest segment of their market well a lot of the baby boomers now are empty nesters and downsizing so they're getting rid of the cumbersome the older product and coming back to something a lot fresher. So just as our lifestyles have become more ca casual, our products have become more casual, except for these luxury brands that also have a completely different expression. But it's just less encumbered than we once were. You know, with, with, with what we're doing, the, the human process of this still stays the same. It, we're all human and we all behave certain ways no matter what. But what we're dealing with filters through technology that we can do it easier, maybe a different way. Maybe the factory is robotic and you put it in one end and it comes out the other. You just hope the numbers are right along the way. At least some of the factories that I'm working with, there's one that has six CNC machines. And so that's exciting for me on a different level of, okay, how can I use this? How can I create something where we can actually use this machinery to create something that I didn't think was actually possible. Um, and I think that there's going to be a lot more of that in the future. There's a few metal factories that I'm in that have robotic sanding already going on. The person is standing there watching it sand to a certain level, and then they're moving on, 
when I lived in Denmark many years ago, <laughs> um, we're talking 2005, they were already doing robotic sanding on wood chairs. And they had had somebody come in and put electrodes on these craftsmen that had been there for many years, probably decades, sanding these same chairs. The electrodes had mimicked the way in which they sand these chairs and robots were already sanding these chairs wow. um, in Denmark in 2006. So I, I can't imagine what that's going to do and become, especially in Asia. Liz, I'm thinking some of the technology in the factories, the CNC's, some robotics, some things that Chris mentioned earlier, may end up helping your more broad appeal price point clients achieve some things they never thought they could. And you're learning that from your factories these days, is that correct? Hopefully they just don't learn how to take our intellectual property and put it into a robot, because I won't, I won't have a job. <laughs> oh, there you go, there you go. And I guess it's the same for you, Chris, with some of the new products and the new investments that the company's making in their factories. Yeah, it's really moving on fast, but I mean, you have, it's never gonna replace a human, no. you know? And uh, it's embrace these new technologies, don't be scared of them. At this point, the panel was asked, how they're designing to engage the current generation, the millennials, and beyond. You're looking at how um, the newer generation is, their lifestyle is changing, the furniture is changing. And it's funny you say traditional is coming back too. It's specific to what your market is and who your clients are. Uh, in urban areas, we in the United States, you know, we have to scale things down. But when stuff is going to Saudi Arabia, they want it grand, and they want it big, and they want it with luxury. Throw everything on it, you know? So we know who our clientele base is, we design for them, and but we're always trying to find how to get to these newer generation as well. And it's, it's, a tr I, it's hard, you know, you, data, uh, you need to, you know, and, and if, if a company has an identity as bringing this one type of product, can't just turn around and do something else. The buyers come to you and they'll say, this is not a, you. Um, so we have our markets. Christopher was then asked, are you selling the luxury or are you lowering the price point to meet the millennials? We found that um, with the Caracol line, they're coming to us for unique pieces. Um, we've gotten into this. We always try to like this price sensitive stuff. If I do, a, if I do, I do the upholstery, right? If I do a regular roll arm, everyone's got a roll arm and they got it at half the price. So I can't do that. I have to, our company, I have to design for the company. It's to put on these special twists, these unexpected twists um, to the furniture. I think what it comes down to is uh, adding value to our product. Um, I'm going to go back and reference that Amish product line that I've mentioned before. Uh, it is um, mainstream or broad appeal, as we're discussing up here, as opposed to, you know, a caracal type product, more luxury item. Uh, but it's pricey. There's no doubt about it. It's handmade, made in the USA. It is pricey. So that's why we go to telling a story. You know, creating, creating a connection with that ultimate consumer on a different level. It's not just competing on a price level. We're offering, um, you know, the, the, the solid wood story, the made in the USA story, the organic, the artisan made story. So all of those things, even for the millennial, um, is added value, is added interest. You know, it captures their attention. So even if it's a little bit pricier, they still, they still reach that far. Maybe they don't buy, you know, an entire uh, uh, dining set, you know, table and six chairs. Well, they might buy the round ped and a couple chairs or four chairs, you know, just start with whatever they can. But it has, um, it, it speaks to them from, uh, you know, from, from the intention for the, the, it, the product conveys you know, a message, an expression that they can connect with. And I think that that's powerful. 
The audience's final question for the panel was who are their competitors that they're looking at every day and how do they maintain their originality in today's marketplace? I think I'm not looking at any particular line um, or competitor for that matter. I like to look at competitors' products more to get a grasp of what they're doing to make sure that I'm doing something else because it's really alarming to know how many designers are thinking of the same thing at the same moment and you get to that factor you're like I just drew that and I've never seen that before um, so I'm trying to keep aware of what other people are doing but again too I like looking at Instagram um, and looking at jewelry design or looking at um, <clears throat> botanicals and how can I make a piece of hardware look like that leaf that's just gorgeous um, for me it's never one line um, and I think some of us up here, I know Curry, people look at Curry for inspiration and um, we're, we're just like everybody else, trying to do it on our own and being original. And I think that's something that I hope everybody does in this industry is keep trying to be yourself and being original um, as best as you can. I look to other companies to see what they're doing, to make sure that I keep my things original, see what they're doing, what's out there, what's selling. So some companies specifically that I look to are ringleaders like Restoration Hardware. What are they doing? Why is it working so well for them? How can I make that work for the companies that I work for, but not knock them off? Just take some nods from how they do it. They take a form and they put the same finishes on it and it sells like hotcakes. <laughs> so maybe I take a form that works for my client. It'll be smaller scale probably because I do a little bit more commercial furniture and see what finishes that client needs if they have um, coastal stores, we're going to want to put a lighter finish on it to appeal to them. But that same collection, you can put a dry gray finish on it and that's what the millennial is going to want. So just gathering information and seeing how it works. Uh, I look at companies that, that are doing unusual and unexpected things. <laughs> Funny story, I, there's, a, there's a company, I think it's from Italy, you always look at it, they do a little bit over the top things. We wouldn't do it, we can't do it. It was Coquette was the name of it. And I saw, I always see it and I never saw it up close and they were in the design center and I saw the case and it had feathers glued to it. We would never do something like that. But I walked up in there and I said, I want to see this thing. I, I always see it through that. Oh, oh, we got caught talking. And she said, where do you work? I said, I work for Caracol. She's like, oh, we always are looking at your stuff. We love your line. So everyone else is, you're thinking there, you know, you have to have integrity in design that you have to be original, you know, come on, you just can't keep on knocking people off. And, you know, a tear sheet is there for inspiration, it's not to be copied. We really need to bring the focus of our furniture industry back to original thought, original, you know, and design we did, and we, creativity. We would just end up at a dead exactly. end and it would just exactly. be a bunch of the same low, middle, high and that's no fun. Well, I'm going to bring it to a close and thank all of our panelists for being here today thank and thank you, you for being thank here. You. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you all. This episode of Design Between the Lines Live is brought to you by the International Society of Furniture Designers. To find videos of this and other podcast episodes, be sure to subscribe to the International Society of Furniture Designers YouTube channel. To learn more about ISFD, visit isfd.org.